Trigger warning, trigger warning, viewers. You've entered a very unsafe space. This is Mark Latham's Outsiders, where Australia's most politically incorrect news and current affairs program. No political correctness here whatsoever. We say what we think. We give it to you straight. Plenty of straight talk and a big, big program this evening. We're going to cover all the issues about fake Iranian refugees in Australia. An update on Mrs A, our teacher from last week's show, had that remarkable account of how she was threatened by radical Islamic students at a primary school in Sydney. We're going to have a look at uh, the budget, Alan Joyce and the pie face. We've got Bernard Gain all later on, one of the wonderful free speech warriors in Australia, standing up for his rights uh, in the workplace and, and effectively for all Australians in the action he's taken through the High Court. So thanks for watching us this evening. Now, of course, Mark Latham's Outsiders, we're alternative media. We don't have the big commercial backing. We haven't got the billion dollar budget of the ABC. We haven't got George Soros funding us like he does for Get Up, that left wing outfit. They're rolling in money. We rely on your support. And if you can help us out by kicking the can, it's greatly appreciated. The support page is support.marklathamsoutsiders.com. Beyond that, we've got our YouTube uh, channel to have a look at for replays of, of this Mark Latham's Outsiders YouTube. And there's the website, which is full of information with our wonderful writers, uh, Corin Barraclough, uh, Bettina Art and others, my columns from the Daily Telegraph, all the materials there at www.marklathamsoutsiders.com. Most importantly, that support page again, support.marklathamsoutsiders.com. If you can help us out, the bills come in. We need to keep the show going to give you the straight information the sort of stuff you don't see in the mainstream media. And if I can just give a special call out to one of our previous guests, uh, Dane Vandenute from the commercial fishing media. Dane, inspired by the opportunities of Facebook live streaming, has set up his own podcast and moving to Facebook uh, webcasting effectively. Dane's a great guy doing wonderful work there. So if you can support him at commercial fishing media as well. And our formats are on the march. We know mainstream media is not what it used to be. Some of them are falling apart like Fairfax. Uh, I'm not uh, crying about that. So if you can support the alternative media, you're doing a very good thing for our country and our democracy. And tonight, of course, it's my pleasure to welcome back Ben Fordham. G'day, Mark. How are you? Very well. I'm Great to have you here. Mainstream media, but I'm also part of the alternative. Mate, media you are in the lucky so. position of being an all-round superstar <laughs> with a foot in all camps. Well, if you, you need a foot in every camp these days, don't you? Because you, you do. never know where your future's going to be. You might look back on this as a wise little foot to have <laughs> in our camp. So it's great to have you here Couldn't with us. Be here to give us your expertise. And Cyrus Sarang, thank you for joining us because no uh, we're going to start with a topic that you're interested in. The news on the front page of the Daily Telegraph yesterday about fake Iranian refugees, six of them, who've um, uh, allowed uh, to stay in Australia for the time being by the foolishness of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. These six, uh, six fake Iranian refugees came to Australia under the policies of Rudd and Gillard, the boat people, they paid the people smugglers, the documents have gone overboard, of course, and uh, we're finding out now their, their stories. Now, of course, the best known fake Iranian refugee in recent Australian history is under the most tragic of circumstances. It was Man Monis, uh, the fellow who caused the tragedy at the Link Cafe siege, the death of two innocent people uh, in, a, in an act of, of terror, the like of which we don't want to see repeated. So the news about the other six was very disturbing from the memory of those two words, Man Monis. Now, the, the timing, of course, uh, is relevant to the fact that coroner's report on the Link Cafe is due next Wednesday, Ben. So what will people be looking for in that report? Well, I think different people will be looking for different aspects of that report. For mine, I'm going to be really interested in having a look what the report says about the wrestle between the army and the police, because this was a police matter. It was being handled by the New South Wales Police. However, uh, special forces were on standby uh, in the CBD and, and at Holsworthy, getting ready to go. Going through, they had a full uh, breakdown, a map of what was going on inside the Link Cafe. They were working out exactly how they were going to go in there and take out the sole gunman. They wanted to do it. They were ready to do it. But New South Wales Police said, no, this is our brief. This is our case. We're looking after it. I've always had the view that trained specialists working with the Army who are used to being in Afghanistan or Iraq are much better at taking out a terrorist than police who, God love them, we appreciate what they do every single day of the week, but they're not dealing with a terrorist situation and a hostage situation on a regular basis when that's what these guys do in Afghanistan and Iraq, that's what they're paid to do. And I personally think that we need to have a better arrangement where police are prepared mm. to say, okay, well look, we need to bring in the specialists here. But there does seem to be a little bit of a, 
an arm wrestle sometimes, and you even see this through emergency services as well. Sometimes there'll be a battle between the New South Wales Fire Brigade and the Rural Fire Service over mm. who's putting out a fire, where I think as a community and as a society, we say, look, there's no, no room here for these kind of petty games. We need the best people. Yeah, on they've the job. got to put pride to one side. And so get the I'll, best I'll be looking, out, the I'll public, be looking yeah. out for that. But I know that, that Cyrus is keen on, on whether or not this is going to be viewed as a, as a terror issue or a mental health issue. Well, Cyrus, just to introduce you properly, you've got extensive background in Iran. You're Australia's, one of Australia's experts on Iranian uh, refugees in this country. You gave evidence at the coroner's uh, inquiry because you knew Man Monis and in fact uh, reported him twice to the authorities to say this guy is much more than some show pony parading around in front of the media. He's actually a danger to Australian society. Unfortunately, your uh, warnings weren't heeded. And uh, having given your evidence to the inquiry, what are you expecting? What is the important thing for the coroner to find? The important thing for me is and, uh, this person, Man Monis, he was a terrorist. And this was a terrorist activity, and because he came from Iran, and Iranian regime is the mastermind of terrorists around the world. So that's why he came here, and he did this propaganda, changed the religion to ISIS, with nothing to do with that. And he was an Ayatollah. He was a minister of the intelligence service uh, in Iran. He was working for the regime. He came with one month's visa. Uh, as an economic visa for petroleum. He went to WA, one month finish, and then they find out he has stolen few information from the Ministry of the Intelligence Service. That's why they hostage his wife and two daughters. Yeah, how long did it take you to find out that this fellow was up to no good, that he had intentions uh, that, that, that would be damaging? Well, the he was here around 16 years, but I find out uh, when I came to know him, he chained himself up in WA, mm -hmm. and he was not successful there. And he did, uh, because it was the weather or whatever, he chained himself in the parliament. And they said, we cannot help you. Then he faked himself. He become unconscious. The ambulance picked him up, and they took him to hospital. There was a talkback radio there. They said, who is this turban-headed mullahs in WA? Mm. What he wants? And these two commentary, you know, they go at each other. They were laughing. They said, oh, we don't know who he is. And uh, he's saying he need uh, uh, help to get his family here. Then the other commentary said, why he chain himself here for? He, he, uh, he should have gone to the sea and chain himself to the monster. They were laughing. Mm -hmm. Then the other one said, listen, don't teach him, otherwise he will go and he do that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he came back to Sydney. They told him to go back to Sydney, Parliament Sydney here. Uh -huh. He came here and he chained himself here. Then I saw him in front of the Parliament. Right. And it take me at least more than two and maybe three years or four years to find out who is this character. Right, but you're convinced he was of rational mind, he was calculating, he knew exactly what he was doing, he wasn't mentally ill. No, 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 he was not. Absolutely, I'm not buying it. He was perfect, he was intelligent, he was manipulator, and he manipulated the uh, immigration, he manipulated uh, the federal police, he beat the federal police and the immigration. You have to ask the authorities how one month economic visa Turn to the citizenship of this country. He also manipulated judges as well because, of course, he was facing serious charges in relation to sexual assault and also conspiracy to murder mm. in relation to an ex-girlfriend or someone who was killed by his then-girlfriend. And he managed to manipulate the justice system as well to get bail. He not, that he's, not that he's the only person to do that. And he sent those dreadful letters out as well, didn't to he? To all so of the, the families of dead soldiers. But mm. I think what Cyrus is saying is right. I think if there's a... If there's some kind of finding, and I'm not suggesting there's going to be, but can you imagine the reaction, Mark, if all of a sudden they talk out the, they play well, the mental health worry. card? Yeah, well, around the world there's a tendency, some of the authorities, perhaps left-leaning, I'm not saying that about the New South Wales circumstance, but there is a tendency around the world mm. to rationalise away these acts of terror to just say, oh, they were sick, they were mentally ill, yeah. when uh, Islam is, is absolved of any blame. So um, that is a tendency we see in other countries, and we're hoping 
based on what you've had to say, Cyrus, it's not a, a, a finding that we have next week. And even though you, he wasn't a member of Islamic State, we all know that that all changed a number of years ago when they just started saying, you don't need to sign up, you don't need to be trained by us, you just need to have the same ideology, take up arms, Absolutely. run people down, shoot people, take hostages, wherever Absolutely. you are anywhere in the world. So he turns up with the wrong flag, but it didn't matter, and he was then trying to get the right flag. He was taking up that call to arms that had been sent out by Islamic yeah. State. That Cyrus, you, you, you've mentioned that he was a manipulator. Yeah. We had the news on the front page of the Daily Telegraph yesterday. There's other manipulators out there, six fake Iranian refugees. One of these uh, uh, fellows had been back to Iran three times. He got married there. He started his honeymoon there. No sign of persecution in those circumstances. Another one had taken out an Iranian passport to allow the travel between our country and Iran. How is it after the Man Monis experience, this fake Iranian refugee, we've got six other fakes that the Minister Peter Dutton has tried to deport, overruled temporarily, hopefully, uh, by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. What's happening in the system that allows this to happen time after time? Mr Mark, I think this is like a catch-22, isn't it? This is a joke, isn't it? It's a, well, it is a joke. It's a, it's a joke as we yeah. look at it, but the serious consequence with someone like Man Monis means we need to crack down like on it. it. Mm. These refugees, they got a lot of you know, tricks in their sleeves, and uh, they are not uh, genuine refugees. They manipulate the system. They beat the system. If they have been tortured in Iran or in Algeria or their, their countries, you know, how dare they are going back there and even get married and bring the wife over? This is like a catch-22. What should Australia be doing about it? Well, they have, this is the wake-up call for Australia. As I warned Australia before, and that AAT has got the heaviest responsibility in, in shoulder. Mm. How they decide, how they judge this matter. These people are not refugees. Are there more than six? Of course. How many in I your tell you, estimate? I can guide the Australian immigration. Go to from 2000 and open up the file, who has visited the Iran, and you look at the file, are they refugees, they applied for refugees or not. Are we talking about dozens, scores, hundreds? Uh, maybe more, dozens. I, I, dozens? I can say maybe uh, three to six thousand. Three to six thousand yes, sir. fake Iranian yes. refugees in Australia. Yes, they have wow. to open up the file, and they have to see if these people have visited Iran. They've been Iran. back. They've been yes. back safely. Yeah. It and will say, to oh, he has been visited Iran, and he applied for refugee in this country. Mm. So means he's a manipulator. Ben, yeah. that's an he's amazing statistic. Oh, this is coming from a bloke who's from Iran as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to well, keep that in mind when we're listening to Cyrus. Cyrus has got qualifications listed as long as your arm. Yes. Yeah. Is one of Australia's preeminent experts. More than 3,000. Yeah. Six then is just a, a drop in the ocean. And, and, and we need to remember as well, it only takes one. It only takes one mistake, one slip, and you can have someone like the Lint Cafe gunman who took the lives of Tory Johnson and Katrina Dawson. It only takes one. We've heard this week that the Administrative Appeals Tribunal has overruled the Immigration Minister 4,000 times, 4,000 cases where this unelected tribunal has overruled a bloke who has been given the job of being the Immigration Minister He's been voted into Parliament by his local constituents, sworn into the job as the Governor-General, selected by the Prime Minister, but he gets overruled by this tribunal that's made up of former MPs who were once in Parliament, who've now been booted out of Parliament. Yeah, rejected by the people. The they people, now the people get to say, overrule the, the people ones say, who People say, we there. don't want you making decisions for the Australian people. They get shoehorned onto the tribunal mm. and get to make uh, decisions overruling the Minister. I think Peter Dutton is doing a great job. I think he's a very, very good Immigration Minister, but he must be at the point are pretty well wanting to abolish I would, I the tribunal, would isn't he? Well, either that or you'd want to walk out and say, I, I throw my hands up in the air and give up here because I try and do everything I can to keep people safe and then I get overruled. I just can't imagine how frustrating But Cyrus, what's your message to the federal government? Go through these cases one by one yes. and examine who's been back to Iran safely, returned Absolutely. to Australia, I agree and call that. them out as well. I'm ready to see the Minister of Immigration face to face mm -hmm. and tell them, these Iranian or these refugees, they got tricks in their sleeves, mm. all the back doors, all that manipulating the government and the immigration. I can put it on the table for him ready. Mm. You know, they go from here to Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, Greece, Pakistan, India, with Australian passport, of course. They go back there, 
and they go to the embassy, they say, oh, I came from Iran and I lost my passport. They get the temporary uh, protection identification. Mm -hmm. He goes back to Iran yes. and he get one passport, bribery of course, and he come back again to India and he, he flew or fly you know, to Australia with Australian passport or from Turkey, from Indonesia and Malaysia. You understand what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah, 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 sure. So these people, they have been applied for yeah. the refugees and asylum seekers. So I supposed to support the refugees, which I do, but they should be genuine. They should not go back to their country. Yes. They suffer. You know, they have been hammered. You know, they have been tortured. And their families, mothers, daughters have been raped in their that country. These people are the genuine refugees, honestly. We the, have to support them. The, the irony is if Mark said something like this, then you'd be branded some kind of bigot. Oh yeah, picking but it's on coming people. from picking a bloke who's from Iran who yeah. goes out of his way to look after Iranian refugees, yeah. and hopefully you'd think that some people would actually listen and go, well, we can't go labelling this bloke a bigot because that's where yeah. he's from and this is what he's interested yeah. in. Well, Cyrus is making the point that's always been valid in the refugee debate, unless they're genuine, mm. unless they're honest, unless they've come to Australia through the right process instead of paying people, smugglers, yeah, uh, they pay money they're coming they here money against the, the, the wishes of the Australian government. Unless the program is genuine, mm. as Australian terminology, fair income, yeah. unless it's fair income, it won't sustain public support because yeah. it can't. Yeah. You can't have people like Man Monitor, and now we hear of, 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 of more than 3,000 fake Iranian refugees. Yes. You can't expect the Australian people to support stuff mm. that's fundamentally dishonest and against our national interest. Yeah. So, I mean, it's time for government to wake up to this. And you're meeting with Peter Dutton? You've got a meeting lined up? Well, or can I'm we asking help you? you. I'm requesting yeah, well, you. Well, if it is possible... You know, I'm ready to go there and, you know, shake hand with him and talk to him, you know, face to face, you know, what is going well, on we in this. We I want you to achieve that. I'll and, asylum seekers. Yeah. and I can tell him, you know, all the truth, what is going on. Mm. And i tell you one thing. The federal police raided my place. Can you believe this? They, they raided my place. They gave me four pages, four o'clock morning. Your name is in a terrorist act organization. This is a cash county too. This is a joke of what? Yeah. Am I terrorist or man monos is terrorist? Well, you identified the bloke who was the terrorist. So exactly, I, I came I, out. How, how did, how did, tell me what was going through your head just, just briefly. Be, I'm sure people would be interested to know. When the news came out that the man inside the Lint Cafe holding the shotgun, alleging that he had a bomb strapped to his back and other bombs around the city, that would then go on to kill two people, when you realised, hang on a moment, that's him. That's the man that I've been warning about. That's the man I've contacted right. the authorities about. Tell me what was happening in your head. I was burning in all my body. I was upset. I didn't know what to do. I ring Channel 7. I ring Channel 9. And they were busy. They, I said, I know him. I can tell you the truth. They were not. All the door was closed. Mm. They said they want to bring his body to Newtown Hospital. I went there, the media was there, and I talked to the reporter, I know this man, mm. I can give you the whole details, they rejected me. Mm. So, th so there was an opportunity for authorities yes. to have listened to your earlier warnings about this man, yes. and if so, the Lint Cafe siege wouldn't have taken place. Absolutely, I warned and I, I called the federal police, we had a meeting in a coffee shop, and I told him, listen, and deport him. This man is loose in a city and he is dangerous to the Australian community, Australian society, and you know, it, uh, he, he is up to something. And he looked at me and he laughed. He said, Cyrus, Australia is a democ democratic country. He has a citizenship. We cannot deport him. I said, Excuse me, I give a damn about that. You have to deport this man like uh, uh, the other sheikh you deport him. Mansur Lagai, I was mm. happy. I carry my own suitcase and I said, go home. Yeah. Why not him? Yeah. Then he's, he laughed. He wanted to change the subject. He said, mm. hey, Cyrus, I like your suitcase. Mm. You see? Everything will be okay. Yeah, everything will be okay. Well, what we've established tonight is that the, the man Cyrus Sarang, who identified man Monis early on as a risk and a danger to the community, is now saying to the federal government, there are more than 3,000 fake Iranian refugees in Australia. The government's got to go through case by case to identify these circumstances and deport those who are having a lend of our country playing us as mugs. So for Peter Dutton and his colleagues, we want uh, Cyrus here to have the meeting. 
and get to the bottom of this. It's a supreme matter of public safety and the integrity of the Australian immigration and refugee system. This problem must be fixed. Otherwise, people are not going to support any of this That's into right. the future. It is completely unsustainable. Now, on the subject of getting uh, meetings with ministers, last week here on Mark Latham's Outsiders, we had Mrs A, the heroic school teacher who copped uh, threats and harassment from radicalised Islamic students at a Sydney primary school. The good news there is she has achieved a meeting with the minister in New South Wales, Rob Stokes, for the 8th of June. Before we talk about that, let's just have a recap of what Mrs A had to say on the show last week. Watching it all together. But some of the things that I was subjected to um, was I had students coming into class flying um, flags from overseas, um, be it the Syrian flag and possibly the ISIS flag. Um, may not it, be it looked to you like... It looked to me like the ISIS, ISIS flag. flag. Right. Um, there was uh, there was one occasion where a couple of boys had come to school wearing T-shirts that appeared to be ha have um, I the ISIS flag or um, wording that was related to ISIS. Um, there was one incident where uh, a group of our students had actually circled me up against a wall and started chanting the Quran to me. Um, that, that was quite scary and it wasn't only scary for me but it was also quite intimidating for the other students. That were now, Ben Fordham, you spoke to Mrs A uh, on Radio 2GB the following day and you understand the seriousness of what she's saying. It's good the Minister Rob Stokes is meeting on the 8th of June, but what needs to be done across the board here to get on top of the problem? Well, it's a, well, first of all, they need to actually listen up when you've got people whose heart is in the right place and his head is in the right place who are warning about these things because she made many, many more warnings about what was going on in that 200, environment. 200, 200 of them. Matters entered in the departmental database. And that, that's on the database on the record. She made 200 warnings. I'll give you another example, Mark, from East Hills Boys High in 2014. So in 2014, all of a sudden, uh, graffiti started appearing around East Hills Boys High saying ISIS is coming. And there was someone who was working at that school who was deeply concerned because he believed that there was radicalisation going on at the school. I started covering what was going on on the radio at East Hills mm -hmm. Boys High and I conducted an interview with someone at that school and we disguised the voice of the person walking, working at that school because they were worried that they would lose their job for blowing the whistle. So we disguised the voice. However, the education department, instead of listening to the warning from the person who was saying, hey, you've got to be careful here, there are some really radical elements here that are trying to turn people to do the wrong thing and to harm innocent people, instead of doing that, they got some kind of software to determine the voice of the person who'd been interviewed. They then contacted that person and stood them down. They were gone, disappeared, never so returned shot, they, to they East Hills the I've never confirmed that that is the person that they, that they got the right person, but you can probably read between the lines because we were quite upset because we thought, hang on, we went to yeah, yeah. extreme lengths to try and disguise the voice of the person to protect them, but sure enough, that person then cops a phone call from the education department in New South Wales and they say, oh, sorry, you're in trouble for talking to the media. Well, so they were more interested in persecuting the bloke who was sounding a warning. And this was no bigot, this was no extremist. This is a guy going, hang on, there's stuff going on around this school that I'm privy to that I've seen and that people need to know about. They shot the messenger instead of listening to the warning. So you're saying there's a culture of cover-up in the Department of Education. Well, Mrs A had a similar experience. She was told by the principal, harden up, uh, get over it, and that's the way these kids are. Now, that's just completely insufficient. Well, it, it? it turns out you have to have your warnings ignored 200 times, or you have to lose your job, or you have to go on Mark Latham's Outsiders until you actually have someone who says, right, oh, let's have a listen to you, where you've mm. got people, they keep on telling us as far as terrorism is concerned, we all have to keep our eyes open and our ears open to listen out for anything if we see True. something. Mm. But you've got people, like the gentleman sitting next to me, like Mrs A, who was on your program last week, like the staff member from East Hills Boys High, when they sound the alarm, they're the ones who end up being told, sorry, you're the troublemaker, get out of here. Mm. Mm. Cyrus, what's uh, your view of, of, of uh, radicalisation in the, in the schools? How big is the problem in your understanding and what do we need to do about it? Well, it depends to the you know, education ministry in this country as well, how they are handling it. And if they prophesize or you know get all these Muslims or radical to that uh, school, so they have to be monitored as well. Uh -huh. So if they are not monitored, that thing is happening 
and they rule their own propaganda and rule and regulation. So and this is bad actually for the society. For the young generation, they grow up, they uh, you know, educated in that uh, school as well. Mm. So it's bad. My understanding is you know, they have to be monitored and they have to follow the procedure of the you know, Ministry of the, uh, Education in this country. Otherwise, uh, you know, they have to change it. Yeah, it seems sad to say it, but the first step is to take these problems seriously. We're, yeah, we've got right. two instances here, fake Iranian refugees and, and Mrs A's case, where the person identifying the problem hasn't been taken seriously. The problem itself is not being um, uh, judged with the, the, mm. the gravity that it deserves. Yeah. There's a culture here of uh, see no evil, hear no and, evil, and, and speak no evil. And don't dare use the excuse that, oh, sorry, this stuff's going on at Muslim-only schools, so we don't know what's going on. The radicalisation cases that we have in, in Sydney yeah. have almost exclusively happened at government schools. Mm. So apart from the incident there at East, Bills, East Hills Boys High, I just mentioned, we know what happened at Punchbowl Boys High, where students were being told they didn't have to shake the hands of females, and we had the ex-principal who didn't want the police coming in and doing de-radicalisation programs. There's also Sydney Boys High, so we had, and that's mm. one of the academically selected schools, you know, really hard to get into. But in 2015, we had those two Sydney mm. Boys High uh, students who were going to Sydney Airport, going off to fight with Islamic State. This is a problem in government schools, yeah. and that's why they can't afford to say, oh, well, we don't really know what's going on. This stuff happens behind the scenes. You've got people who are on the government payroll who are speaking up and sounding the alarm, and instead of having another Mrs A where they're ignored for years on end with 200 complaints, start listening to these people. They may be wrong on occasions, but it's the one where they're right and you're preventing another Lint Cafe siege or another case like Curtis Cheng, the police employee, who was killed by a Sydney schoolboy. They're the ones that we've got to stop. Absolutely, absolutely. Cyrus, thanks for your time this evening. Not a problem, We're going so to I move our that. show along thanks. and uh, move to a different panel after some regular features. One of them is something we started up uh, last week with our cartoon in residence, Zeg. He's a genius who gives us the cartoons. He's submitted two this week based on his experiences. And the first of those we're going to bring up from Zeg the cartoonist is... Uh, Alan Joyce there um, with the uh, pie in the face and Johnny Howard walking over to the side saying, harden up Joyce, it was a cream pie, not even a shoe. Howard copped the shoe. Some people say I tried to break his hand back in the day <laughs> and he didn't press charges against any of us. So why is Alan Joyce going ahead with the charges there against the pie chucker? And of course the second cartoon from the great uh, Zeg that he submitted is based on his experience from Monday night where he was at the Central Coast Forum with Paul Murray live looking at the budget, Scott Morrison trying to de defend it and the public there asking what the hell was going on. I don't, I, Zeg must have had a camera there for Mark Latham's Outsiders with the uh, PC buster sign as well and um, uh, you've got the green fellow in the background of course saying it was the best budget ever, he would say that because <laughs> all the tax and spend and big debt and deficit, it was a Labor and Green budget rather than a Liberal one and hopefully Scott Morrison got a good old raz at the Central Coast Leagues Club there on Monday night. Thanks very much to Zeg. And uh, we're also, after this uh, little uh, interval, going to have a look at the media industry. Well, one of the things that's happened is the Senate inquiry. You've got two of the showmen up there, sneering Sam Dastiari and Nick Xenophon with their stunts. The stunt they're pulling is to have a uh, Senate inquiry into the future of the media, fake news, propaganda. They reckon they're going to say where it comes from. Well, I think it's interesting in Sam Dastiari's defense of Fairfax to look at the sort of rubbish, apparently taxpayer-funded rubbish, that he puts on his own Facebook page. We're going to have a look at one of Dastiari's videos using his two little innocent daughters there as props, political props, looking at the Fairfax issue. Let's look at the ridiculous Dastiari video. Hi girls. Hello Daddy. Do you know what's lots of fun? Let's learn about Fairfax management through My Little Pony. Yay! Yay! Now girls, these are the manager ponies and these are the worker the ponies. Pony. Yeah. Now this is the head manager. His name's Greg. Say hello, Greg. Hello, hello, Greg. Greg says the things management say like this. My magic shines like the sun. <laughs> the managers have lots of lollies and the workers have some lollies. Hannah, who has more lollies? The managers. Oh. Now the managers are saying the workers have to give up 30 more of their lollies. Eloise, is that fair? Mm. No? Why is it not fair? Because they still have more lollies than them. And what happens if they give up, have to give up 30 lollies? Um, some people have to 
Because there won't be enough lollies for them, will there? Yeah. Well, you're watching Mark Latham's Outsiders. I'm joined by Ben Fordham from Channel 9 and Radio 2GB. Well, Ben, you can only hope the Senate inquiry's got a bit more sophistication, seriousness and intelligence than what Sam Dastiari just showed us there in that ridiculous video. In all seriousness, can you just explain to me what this Senate inquiry is even looking into? Because when I first heard, there was about a month ago when something came out from Sam Dastiari, Shanghai Sam as I call him, where he said that he wanted to hold a Senate committee into fake news. I invited him on my mm -hmm. radio program that afternoon because I thought, I can't believe that this bloke is wasting taxpayers' money and having a look at so-called fake news. I mean, it's got nothing to do with the Parliament of Australia. Invite him on that afternoon. Surprise, surprise, he was unavailable because he probably had some sense of where I was going to go on it. But what is the point well, of Well, it's Senate an inquiry, inquiry into the future of public interest journalism. Yes. Looking at fake news, propaganda and public disinformation, including sources and motivation of fake news what? in Australia, overseas and the international response. The argument being, I mean, the, the, the leftist conspiracy theory mm. is Donald Trump won because of fake news on Facebook. Yes. And all this fake news out there in alternative media, I mean, mm. they're probably blaming us for it, mm. is uh, driving down the revenue of Fairfax, Channel 10 and the like and putting the mainstream media mm. out of business. I would have thought the evidence at Fairfax shows that that company made a deliberate decision about 10 years ago to pitch their newspapers at about 10% of the population, the yep. inner city lefties, yep. who in the age of the internet get most of their information online mm. and don't buy newspapers. So it was just a dumb, dumb, dumb commercial decision. And you can't blame fake news, especially when the Herald, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, yeah. for, what, 12 months of the American election campaign told us that Donald Trump was completely no unelectable. That was fake news. They were fake. publishing fake news. The problem isn't fake news. The problem is dull news or news that most people just do not find all that appealing, all that, all that interesting. I'll give you an example. When I have a young journalist or young producer come and start working with me on the radio show, and if they're particularly green, if they're just out of university or just out of school, uh, you've kind of got to, I don't think that people are born with news judgment. I think it's something like a muscle that you need to keep on working on to train up. And one of the games that I play with them is I say, look, on a Sunday when you walk into a news agent and you've got the Sunday Telegraph there and you've got the Sun Herald there, or any other day of the week, have a look at those two front pages and ask yourself the question, which one am I going to buy and why? And I can tell you, out of a year, there'll be occasions where the Sunday Telegraph, the News Corp paper, over the Sun Herald, Fairfax, I reckon there might be one Sunday each year, one Sunday each year, maybe two, where I'd say, you know what? I reckon the Sun Herald's got a better front page. It looks more interesting. I think and that they've got. Yeah. I think they're more in touch. I can remember one Mother's Day a few years ago, where on on Mother's Day, maybe two or three years ago, and there was a front page story about a, a shocking attack that had happened to a a soldier in the Australian Army, and that was a front page story. And I and I thought to myself on that day, I was like, well, they don't really. There's someone in there doesn't quite get it because there are part of the art of these things is to think, okay. Mother's Day, let's have something that's going to be appealing to most people on Mother's Day. And that very important, worthy story about this horror story that this kid's gone through in the Australian Army, we can have that on page three, we can have that on page five. Well, the bigger worry than the Senate inquiry is the fact that some of the rent seekers are out there. Eric Beecher and Nick Xenophon have both argued there should be public money, government money, going into bailing out. But it's got nothing to do companies. with, Mark, it's got nothing to do with our federal parliament. What, what is our, our well, news? Well, they're trying to spend our taxpayers' funds on failed media corporations. Yeah, it's pretty alarming. We've got, we've got uh, bodies that look after the media, that police the media. Oh, I mean, I know all about it. We've got the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Uh, there are others in the print world as well. That, and they, that, that's why you occasionally see where there need to be corrections or where there's a, a judgment against a newspaper based on a comment or reporting or a photograph or something that might be incorrect in there. That's already there. This is going to have zero impact. It's more about these politicians sucking up to mates in the media by giving yeah. them the impression, don't worry, yeah. I'm going yeah. into bat I'm for you. I'm on your side, yeah. We're going into bat for you in return for possibly what they perceive to be some positive coverage that they probably won't yeah. get anyway because the journos would be too smart for them. Yeah, well, the good news at Mark Latham's Outsiders is that Sam Dastiara and Nick Xenophon don't suck up to us and we don't want them to. <laughs> we think they're a pair of mugs, wasting taxpayers' money and time in the Australian Senate. Uh, if people want to watch various media outlets or consume and read that product, good luck to them. Let the consumer be king and make their choices. Now, speaking of uh, the poor old taxpayer, what about the 
federal budget, tax and spend, it seems like debt and deficit's the order of the day for the foreseeable future. You had Mark Burris on your radio program this afternoon. I respect his judgment. I had hoped he'd be here this evening. That wasn't possible. Mm. But he's heavily critical of the bank tax, is he? Well, not so much the bank tax, uh, but the banks in there kicking and screaming. And right. I, I must admit, Mark, I've been a little bit surprised by some of the reactions to all of this. because In, in what way? Well, I, I just think that uh, the presumption that a lot of people have had straight away of, look, this is a failure of a policy, the bank tax, because it's going to be passed on straight away. I'd rather people focus their attention immediately to say, let's jam these people and make sure they actually do foot the bill themselves. You go through the kind of profits that are being made here. Yes, they pay a lot of tax, but the profits are out of this world. Combank, first half profit, $4.9 billion. The boss and the Rev, $12.3 million a year. NAB, first half cash profit, $3.29 billion. Andrew Thorburn, their boss, $6.7 million salary a year. ANZ, $3.4 billion. The boss, Shane Elliott, $6.1 million salary. Westpac, first half cash profit, $4 billion. Uh, Brian Hart to their boss, $6.7 million. Macquarie Bank, because we now talk about the big five as opposed to the big four. Full year profit of $2.2 billion. Nicholas Moore, their boss, earns $18 million a year. If this isn't an industry that is ripe for the picking of saying there's some money in there that we need to share around in a more equitable fashion than we currently are, let alone some of the shonky behaviour where the banks have just gone way and way beyond public expectation in the way that they've dealt with people, uh, I think that they're lucky that they dodged a royal commission and I think they should be sucking it up, Princess and paying the $6.2 billion mm. over four years. So what, years. what's your reading of the public mood? The zero sympathy for the banks, Morrison's on a winner, and the main objective of government policy should be to make sure that the tax isn't passed on to consumers. But how can I, they do that? Well, I, I would rather mean? everyone, I'd rather Australia get behind the policy and say, let's make sure we're not going to show any sign of wavering at all with the banks here, no sign of sympathy at all. We've got people, These I can't believe these bank bosses are standing up there and playing the sympathy card and saying, can you get behind us? Well, and if you don't get behind us and we don't kill this thing off, we're going to jam you and you're going to have to pay for it anyway. Mm. It's been uh, compared to the mining super profits tax mm. and people are saying, will the banks run a campaign? Of course, uh, Rudd and Swan yeah. put the super profits tax on the mining industry. They ran a very successful campaign. I heard from an impeccable source just last Friday, a great irony here, when that Rudd policy was first announced for the mining tax, yeah. the banks supported it. Yeah. The banks supported it. Later, <laughs> well, uh, changed what? their mind. Now they're uh, yeah. supposedly a victim of and it. And now the banks are saying, oh, hang on, there are other industries as well in Australia where they make multi-billion dollar profits as well, so why don't you go after some of them? So it's always with the banks. It's not us. Do it to someone else. But it's interesting on the mining tax. I think it's a little bit different. I mean, I think the banks are in a different, as far as, uh, I know it's a stereotype, but they're, they're, they're blokes in the city earning the big money uh, and look, I know that mining, I know there are some very uh, wealthy people in this country as a result of mining, but it was kind of a bush fight as well. It was the bush, it was regional communities and towns where mining is key and you've got all of these other support services around them. You've got the butcher and you've got the tradies and everything else. They've all come there for their jobs and I think that's why they're able to win that one. And also, don't forget, Kevin Rudd was on his, on his last legs. I mean, Kevin Rudd was absolutely struggling. It was all, the writing was on the wall that he was going to be doomed as Prime Minister. Then he, then he came up with something called the super profits mm. tax. Uh, in retrospect, I look back and go, it probably should have got up. I don't know whether you agree with that, but you know, it would have been beneficial to our nation well, if it had, we, had we got a bit more money out of what they were digging well, if, out of the ground at yeah, the time. Yeah, if it finished off right, I think that was a good thing. <laughs> I look at it. Possibly. I look at it with the longer view. But now. what do you reckon on the, on the, on the bank tax? On the bank tax? No, yeah. I don't think we, we need new taxes in Australia. I think there's so much spending, and the spending side of the budget's been so neglected. But at the same time, the bank, there's no doubt the banks have brought this upon themselves, mm. and let's be honest about it. The appointment of Anna Bly to represent the Banking Association, yeah. uh, picking her instead of a, a former staffer from Morrison's office, a lot of this is personal. A lot of this is a, a revenge by the federal treasurer for the appointment of Anna Bly. Um, and at many, many levels. I, I've got zero sympathy for the banks. Yeah. I'd have so a lot more... So would we prefer they, they pull $6.2 billion out of the banks over four years or find that $6.2 billion out of all of our pockets and all of well, our lives? Well, there's so much expenditure. Unless you get expenditure under control, you can't bring taxes down. Mm. This is probably the least offensive of the taxes they could introduce. 
But I just wish the federal government would concentrate on the expenditure side. No doubt. Because we'll never have any solution to the yep. debt and deficit problem unless they bring spending under control. Now, speaking of another corporate leader, we've got the news that Qantas has been ringing around the different uh, uh, news centres to say you can't screen the pie-facing of Alan Joyce. This precious guy, he's been out there campaigning as a quasi-politician on same-sex marriage. Uh, he should be attending to the finances of Qantas, which almost went broke a couple of years ago. But be trying to stop commercial outfits from showing the pie-facing, of course, is a form of censorship that's unacceptable. The viewers should see these prominent public events. One of the news houses has caved in to the uh, Qantas demands, which in itself is shameful. Uh, here at Mark Latham's Outside, as we show you this stuff, we've got no commercial agreement with Alan Joyce, never met the guy, not wanting to. Let's have a look at what happened to Joycey when he copped a bit of cream in the gob. Months since I've been here to announce the... Oh. 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 I don't know what that was about. Excuse me, uh, I might take a break for a second, guys, and just clean up a little bit. Well, I've been CEO of Qantas now for, for close to nine years, and it was a new experience here to announce the oh. Oh. <laughs> heck here to announce the oh. Oh. <laughs> heck now I don't regard that as an assault uh, there's no physical harm to him a bit of pie in the face I mean if that was the worst thing to happen to me in politics I'd be pretty happy just to lick the cream off and get on with the speech he's been out there campaigning as a quasi politician now he's pressing charges against the 67 year old man who did this on the basis he doesn't like the corporate campaigning on same-sex marriage but even worse than that, Ben, we, we, we can disagree about the pressing of charges. Yeah. Do you think it's right that Joyce has now banned this guy, this 67-year-old Perth resident, mm. from ever flying on Qantas, ever flying on Jetstar, ever flying on Emirates? I mean, for the poor bugger, if, uh, Je if uh, Virgin banned him, he's going to have mm. to walk across the Nullarbor to get around. I mean, yeah. it's, it's Look, pretty horrendous, isn't it, to uh, put uh, a lifetime ban? A few things on this because there are a number of different, different angles. First of all, I think it was a real dog act of the bloke, regardless of his age, to walk up to someone and shove a pie in their face. You don't think it was funny? No. Well, amusing? Look, I, I mean, it's kind of, it's funny or amusing if you're watching the footy show, right, and someone does it to Sam Newman. That's funny or amusing because you know they're in on the joke. Someone walking up to someone like that, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, they're in the public eye, but, mate, if, that, if that's my dad or my mum or if it was happening to you, you oh, might cop I, it no, sweet, no, I, but yeah, your I boys would, wouldn't. I would. I, I can tell you, I tell, well, it hasn't happened to me, but after a life in politics... Mm. The last thing I would ever think of is pressing charges. Well, really, I, was about really, to get on the charges. I wouldn't press charges. I was about charges. to get on the charges. I, I, that's what I'd say about the incident itself. Tactically, I don't think it was smart to ban the bloke from, from all of the airlines because I think it just reminds people more and more about the story, which clearly he doesn't want people to do because he doesn't want people watching the footage. And equally, on the pressing of charges, oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. But I certainly wouldn't be uh, feeling good about the whole situation and trying to stop the media... I wasn't aware of that until you've said it tonight, but trying to stop the media... There's one outlet anything. who caved in. What's the outlet? I'm not, I'm not at liberty to say, but there's an outlet that did really? cave in that have, has refused to screen it. Alan Joyce, if you don't like the footage, you're at Mark Latham's Outsiders. We are totally uninhibited. I think the footage is hilarious. Let's show it again. <laughs> Come on, Joycey, get this one right into you. Months since I've been here to announce the... Oh. Oh. <laughs> heck. I don't know what that was about. Excuse me, uh, I might take a break for a second, guys, and just clean up a little bit. Well, I've been CEO of Qantas now for, for close to nine years, and it was a new experience. Here to announce the... Oh. Oh. <laughs> f***ing heck. Here to announce the... Oh. 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 F***ing heck. Well, you can see there, Seven News did show it. There, you had their logo right across it, Seven News. They believe in free speech and informing their viewers. Good on Seven News and good on us here at Mark Latham's Outsiders. And if you want to see more of that, I love my phasing of Joyce. I do think it's funny. That's my own personal choice in the world of humour. If you want to support us to make sure you do see the things here you don't see in some parts of the mainstream media, kick the can, support.marklathamsoutsiders.com. We'll bring that up, support.marklathamsoutsiders.com. So hang on a moment. If someone can come up with a $500 donation, <laughs> am I able to put a cream pie in your face? Well, Ben, as I said earlier on, it wouldn't be the worst thing. If the worst thing <laughs> that right. happened to me in politics was a cream well, pie, let's put your money I'd be, I'd be thanking our maker that I'd been so lucky that if that was as bad as If someone donates $500 right now to Mark Latham's Outsiders and say, part of the deal is I want a cream pie in Latham's face, 
then I'll deliver the cream and pie. And as long as I get a good lick on it, I quite like a meringue lemon pie. It was only a soft lemon what a meringue waste. cream pie. What a waste of a good pie. Well, we might scrape it up for the movie. But uh, the other thing we're going to do after uh, our next uh, item is talk to Bernard Gaynor about his struggle for free speech in Australia and also draw on his ex expertise in military intelligence to talk about the situation in Afghanistan, which is very worrying from an Australian perspective. And while we uh, bring Bernard in, on our panel, uh, I want to highlight, in terms of uh, political humour, I absolutely love Greg Gutfeld out of uh, Fox News in the United States, the Gutfeld program, and he opened up on the weekend with a wonderful, wonderful routine about Trump derangement syndrome in the United States, the sacking of FBI chief James Comey and all the business about Russia, Russia, Russia. Let's have a look at Gutfeld's opening stanza from his program to give us a bit more political comedy of the highest order. And after that, we'll be talking to Bernard Gaynor. Enough. Enough. Behold the MOAP. Mother of all presidents. That's right. President Trump did it again by firing James Comey, causing the media to dissolve in vapid clouds of hot steam. This is an extraordinary moment in American history. You bet it is, Wolf. And it's a grotesque abuse of power by the President of the United States. The timing now looks like it is connected to Russia no matter what the President says. And this is where it's going to become a political hot potato. A little whiff of fascism tonight, I think it's fair to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. A little wish, a, wi a little whiff of, I don't care about the law, I'm the boss. A whiff of fascism. <laughs> I believe that's my new cologne, whiff of fascism. I wear it at the club, with a club. <laughs> Yeah, but Donald Trump, the media are like birds freaking out over a sudden noise. What was that? A gunshot, a car horn, a squirrel. He fired somebody. Panic is so exhausting, but it's great for ratings. So for now, it's all about one thing. This whole idea that, especially on your network, you always want to talk about Russia, Russia, Russia. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Russia, Russia, Russia. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Russia, Russia, Russia. Hey, you guys. <laughs> how I feel every time but it's true look at Rachel Maddow it's all Russia 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 and if Russia is Rachel's Watergate then Comey is her Archibald Cox Archibald Cox Archibald Cox was the special prosecutor who was brought in to investigate the Watergate case Archibald Cox Archibald Cox and what Nixon did is he came for Archibald Cox Archibald Cox to Archibald Cox and Archibald Cox looked the president in the eye and would not do that Fire Archibald Cox. Fire Archibald Cox. Fire Archibald Cox. Archibald Cox? Yeah, he did get fired. Let's just admit, Archibald is a great name. <laughs> no one's naming their kids Archibald anymore. I blame him. But the left are delirious to a point that even comedians become disoriented. Huge story that broke little just minutes ago, like less than 10 minutes ago. FBI Director James Comey has just been fired by Donald Trump. Wow. Huge, huge Donald Trump fans here tonight. I don't think he expected that response. The Gutfeld Show, absolute comic genius. He really is good with the way he's stitching up his other commentators. With Trump derangement syndrome, Russia, 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 Marsha, 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 it's overrunning the United States. You're watching Mark Latham's Outsiders, where I'm joined by Ben Fordham, still with us Thank you, on the panel for his uh, expert insight into these issues. And Bernard Gaynor has joined us. I want to thank you, Bernard, because you are one of the warriors of free speech in our country. I've studied your circumstances carefully. And I think all Australians should be aware of what's happened here. Bernard served in the Australian Defence Force for 12 years, uh, a decorated, honoured soldier praised by the Americans for his service in Iraq as part of the intelligence apparatus. He was in Iraq at the most dangerous height of the fighting in 2004. Uh, he has served our country with uh, great uh, honour and bravery. We want to thank you for your service to Australia in that regard. But in coming back to um, Australia and then joining the Defence Reserve, Bernard had made some public uh, comments on social media about his preference for the education of his children. He said, 
he wouldn't have uh, gay teachers educating his children in the school. It's not a comment I'd, I'd, I'd uh, subscribe to. It's not something I believe in myself, but I would have thought it's a valid opinion from a Christian father on his values and his preferences for his children. If you're talking about a father's love of children and wanting the best for them according to his assessment in education, I think that's a, an opinion that's always got to be respected. And on top of that, Bernard made the comment uh, that uh, he didn't believe the Defence Force should be part of the gay Mardi Gras in Sydney. And again, that's a, a, an opinion that's uh, got currency in the community. And uh, I think these opinions are um, worthy of respect in a society that values free speech. Now, for your troubles, Bernard, you were rubbed out of the Defence Reserve and you had to take action in the court system to have your rights and yourself reinstated. A federal court judge found in your favour, then it was overturned by the full court, and now you're going to the High Court of Australia. Is that an accurate summary? Where are you up to? What, what are you hoping the High Court will find? Uh, sure. So, Mark, it, it is a pretty accurate summary. And uh, essentially, I think the, the most important thing to understand is yeah, I've made some statements, but the Defence Force has become politicised. Uh, it's embarked on a political agenda. It's become a player, uh, a participant in political activity, such as participation in the Mardi Gras. Uh, and as a result of that, it has now declared war on conservative views uh, and even people who express conservative views in their own private capacity outside the Defence Force, no nexus whatsoever to the Defence Force. And that's a very uh, serious thing that I think Australians should be concerned about. So obviously, uh, I'm hoping to be able to overturn the decision to terminate my appointment as an officer uh, because the precedent that has been set is very damaging. Essentially, it means that any workplace, such as Qantas, for instance, uh, can impose a cultural or political agenda. Uh, and if, if, and if in, uh, a worker there decides or holds views that are contrary to that, such as a position on same-sex marriage, even privately or express them even privately, they can be sacked. Uh, that's the precedent that's been set because those views are deemed incompatible with the culture of the workplace. Uh, so I'm hoping to overturn the decision, not just for myself, but to overturn the precedent that's been set. It's a dangerous one. Yeah, I think it's very dangerous because what it's basically saying is that as someone in the workplace, you can't have views of a, a political or values nature uh, without being kicked out of that workplace. Now, I think it goes to the rights of the citizen, the right of free speech, the right of the worker. Where are the trade unions on this? Because it's not just in your circumstance, uh, I know of a council in South West Sydney that is enforcing compulsory domestic violence training on its staff. Now I don't know what that's got to do with running a library or the garbage service or the, the roadworks in that municipality. So you're getting to the point where the workplace is becoming a social laboratory for so-called diversity. In your circumstance, this happened under a trend that started under David Morrison who went on to be Australian of the Year telling us we can't use the word guys. That's right. Now this diversity agenda has a fraudulent side in that it's supposed to be about identity diversity, race, gender and sexuality, but it doesn't tolerate diversity of opinion. As I said, I don't share the opinion you uh, articulated about the education of your children, but I don't have to. I have to respect the values and preferences of a father in the love of children wanting the best for them. Uh, I haven't grown up in, in, in the Christian environment, uh, intensely Christian environment that you have. And I don't see how that opinion has got anything to do with defence responsibilities. Nor do I think it's unacceptable for someone to articulate a view about the gay Mardi Gras. In a democracy, there'll be a range of views. We should celebrate diversity of opinion. And Bernard, what I think, what, what's happening to you, I think, is one of the worst examples of closing down diversity of opinion under a different diversity banner, and it's undemocratic bordering on totalitarian. I wish you every success in the, in the High Court. Ben, your thoughts? Yeah, well, is that, there'll be some people watching at the moment going, now, oh, come on, what else did you do? No, no, that's, that's it. That's it. No, no, that's it. That's no, so I know. I'm just clearing that up for mm. people because I know that, and I know your story, but there'll be some people who aren't familiar with it who'll be going, he must have done something else. He couldn't have just, so what, were they on Facebook and Twitter? Where did you make the comment? So, so uh, first of all, the statement about the education of my children, I just want to take Mark up on a point here. I think every parent has the right to determine how their children are educated. Absolutely. And anyone who says that my views are wrong or bigoted or not to be tolerated mm. is essentially saying they have more right mm. over how my children where, are educated. Where did you make the comment? 
So I made my comment on Twitter, but that's got nothing to do with the no, defense. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that about your views. Yeah. I respect your yeah, views. I understand that's not that. the views that I hold. So yeah, that's make, right. You but make that's a diversity of opinion. You make a comment on Twitter about how you want your children to be taught or whether you want yeah. them to have gay teachers. And then the comment about the gay Mardi Gras yep. was on where? On Twitter as so, well. So, uh, Facebook and my webpage. But just, just to but, put it in context. But, but that's, that's what it's there for. I mean, that's what this whole thing... That's what Facebook's there for. That's what Twitter's there for. And you're not saying, I think you should... I'd like someone to go out and kill this person. You're not saying, I want someone to go out and sabotage the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. If a bloke can't have it make a comment like that... Mate, there's no free well, speech whatsoever. Bloke, a father, a father well, loving anyone, children, I don't care wanting the best. I mean, the most. Uh, you, we all know that. As, as three fathers sitting here on the panel, we all know the most important, strongest, rawest emotion in your body mm. is the best thing for your kids. The mm. best thing for your kids. Now, we would articulate that in, in, in express it in different ways, the sure. three of us. But the love and the desire to have the best for the kids would be common. Mm. The uh, the opinions can be diverse, and that's why we call ourselves a democracy. Bernard, what's happened to you is one of the worst things that I've seen in Australian public life. Well, sorry, and it I just makes the point. Don't go out there risking your life for your country because you come back and your rights are stripped. Mm. Well, just and just on this, I just want to just add a bit of detail sure. to Ben's question, especially in relation to defence involvement in the Mardi Gras. Now, defence had a lawful general order that was extant at the time that said defence personnel cannot attend political events in That's uniform. Right. Yep. The Mardi Gras constitution says political, political parties march, political lobby groups march. Defence is breaching its own policies mm. and instead of dealing with that, they chose to sack a person who was pointing it out. Mm. That's what happened. Well, a whole bunch of politicians have decided not to go to Mardi Gras. I think Malcolm Turnbull's the only Prime Minister who's ever attended and I'm sure Kevin Rudd thought it was an inappropriate place for him to be seen and, and John Howard, I think, expressed but that. So it, it, it's, not, it's not exactly a an unfashionable, uh, tiny minority view. You, you've also got to just draw the line somewhere as well. I mean, there always needs to be a line, but you look at any organisation. So, so if you're in the Defence Force, you're a, you're a public servant, right? So therefore, anyone who is employed by the federal government or in the federal public service has to be careful about their own opinion and how they express it, whether it's on social media or whether it's at a barbecue. Hmm. I mean, it does open yourself up to all sorts of situations where, you know, are we going to be going through the social media accounts of, of anyone working anywhere and saying, well, hang on a moment, this person's expressed an opinion on politics, this person's expressed an opinion on free speech or on gay marriage or whatever else, it's got nothing to do with their job. Mm. They didn't do it on the work computer, they haven't mm. involved us, they haven't shamed us in any way, uh, but we're going to go looking as to what they're thinking. Well, Bernard's case is, is, is a test case for this principle that yep. the rights of the worker to do the job without reflection or sacking of them because of their political views, yeah. that's a fundamental right in the workplace. So this is an important test case. But Bernard, beyond that, what's happened to defence culture? There must be huge resistance to this fake diversity agenda and crazy notions of unconscious bias uh, that are being spread through propaganda and uh, tra so-called training courses in the Defence Force. What the hell's going on? Yeah, look, there. I, I think there's a huge morale crisis in the Defence Force. I've been contacted by many, many officers and soldiers uh, who, whose morale is shot. Uh, they're thinking about leaving or they have left uh, because they're no longer doing the job they love, which is training to defend and fighting to, to protect Australia. They're now being forced to attend uh, you know, training on uh, domestic violence, training on equity and diversity, training on Islam, training on you know, uh, feminism. It, all, all this has become the focus, a cultural change a cultural change focus within the Defence Force. And the guys out there love this nation. They want to do a job. They do a good job. They want to, they want to be soldiers. They want to be officers in an army, in a Defence Force. But they've been, become uh, politically correct uh, little cogs inside a politically correct machine that essentially has become run like pretty much every other government department so by the, the Human yeah, Rights Commission rights. and their agenda. Yeah, so the disease of political correctness is even affecting our defence force and our capacity to defend our nation yeah, well if, I we, if we had to. Oh, absolutely. And I can, I can run through a whole list of examples if you well, want. Well, when, you've, when you've got the, uh, the bloke David Morrison, when you've got the former head of the defence force uh, who's going on with all of the side issues that he has and turned it into a complete laughing stock, I mean, we know the importance of leadership at the top. And it was very clear when he became Australian of the Year and I started 
receiving all these phone calls and correspondence from people in the Defence Force, let alone some of the people whose careers were destroyed because this bloke was more interested in, in showing a, a nice clean image to the, to the media and to the community as opposed to actually looking after his people. I think when you have someone like that at the top, well, clearly you're going to have issues down the bottom. And these people are mm. trained to do the most important job that we have in this country, mm. which is to protect us all if, you know, what hits the fan. Mm. So do you really want to be involving all of these people with all of these other diversity issues and gender issues and feminist issues, that's not their job. They've got a job out there where they need to be able to protect well, us and keep us all alive. It's not their job, but it's a common problem, isn't it, right across the Australian political scene? Just, just on Morrison, the day he was photographed in high heels, mm. a collective groan went through the, the ranks of, of many of the, of the soldiers in the Defence Force. It was embarrassing, absolutely mm. embarrassing that this was the guy who commanded the Australian Army, mm. wearing high heels. Well, it's also a guy who made a video, as Mark said, letting us all know that if you walk around a workplace and say, hey guys, it's lunchtime, that you're isolating the female members of yeah, your you're team. you're a misogynist. Well, we had phone call after phone call on the open line from women who were saying, oh, that's just what we say. Mm. Hey guys, let's go, let's yeah, go. And, and the have, women use the... You know, it's the, the same thing. Well. No one says that because they're trying to keep anyone out of the conversation or keep someone out Bernard, of the Bernard, how can people place? assist you? Is it to go to your website, bernardgainer.com.au and, 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 and help with your fighting fund? Because these legal expenses must be uh, absolutely massive. Uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so uh, fighting this defence case uh, and also uh, another anti-discrimination case where I was facing up to $1.6 million in fines for my views on marriage and family um, has cost me over 250 grand wow. uh, in the last three years or so. so. And I could not have done it by myself. I've been uh, assisted and I'm very grateful for it by the support of thousands uh, of ordinary Australians. So they, they are part of this fight as well and I, I think we're part of a team. Yeah, well it's, it's fighting not just for you, it's for the rights of all Australia. This could be an important precedent for establishing the rights of the worker, the rights of the citizen in the workplace can be unaffected by political views uh, that don't really relate to the job that you're doing. So I think it's a fight for the whole country and would be a landmark case in pushing back against political correctness and the Morrison-type disease that's obviously inflicted the Defence Force and, and sadly many other parts of the Australian community. But we want to draw, uh, if we can, uh, on your expertise as a military uh, intelligence expert and uh, Bernard put together a, a neat summary of why we're bogged down in Afghanistan, why Australia will probably be there for a long, long while to come, why we're winning so many battles against uh, outfits like Islamic State, but not winning the war in Afghanistan or Iraq, from what we can tell. Here's Bernard's take on uh, what's gone wrong. In a nutshell, the Australian military and Western governments in general do not understand the enemy. That is why the war in Iraq was a failure and was always going to lead to disaster for Iraq. Furthermore, the rise to power of violent Islamists in Iraq today is a window into the future of Afghanistan. Despite the hard work, bravery and sacrifice of Australian and coalition soldiers, these wars have not made the West safer, nor have they improved conditions for those living in Iraq or Afghanistan, or even the wider Middle East. I used to think and hope that it was otherwise, but wishful thinking does not equal the truth. If you want to know why these wars failed, don't read long intellectual articles that talk about complicated nuances. These pieces only hide the inability of their authors to grasp four simple truths. One, you can't declare war on a tactic, terror. Two, you can't win if the good guys your soldiers are dying for are just a different type of bad guy. Three, you can't win if you promote the problem, Islam. And four, you cannot win overseas if you are losing at home. Now a few of the uh, viewers, many of our viewers are asking how they can support Bernard. Go to his website, www.bernardgaynor, G-A-Y-N-O-R, bernardgaynor.com. .au. There's a uh, donation button there or banner on the website, bernardgainor.com.au. This is a very, very important cause to support. Now, uh, you've given us a, a, a brief tutorial there, Bernard, on the, the uh, intelligence and strategic agenda in places like Afghanistan. What is the summary? What is, what is the future going to hold for Australia's defence commitment? Uh, well, look, I think the first thing to understand is that the only way you can actually do something that has long-term success in places like Afghanistan or the Middle East is essentially to go there for a long time and change the culture. And I don't think any country in the world is willing to do that. Uh, so you've got to accept that you're not going to win over there. And the best thing you can do is try and stop the problem coming to Australia. Uh, and uh, you know that 
relates to immigration and things like that. So uh, unless you go there to change the culture, the best thing you can do is you try and contain the situation as best you can. Well, no country's going to go in and change the culture, but you're right, if the culture's uh, bad, then the problems will keep reoccurring and the Taliban are said to be stronger than ever in Afghanistan. What, 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 what uh, view would our defence strategists take of, of Islam? Do they go into the problems in that religion in detail and, and teach our soldiers the uh, scale of the difficulty that's, that's being confronted with radical Islam? As an uh, intelligence officer in the army, uh, with many years experience, I can tell you defence has zero understanding, uh, and this goes across national security and policing agencies in Australia well, as well, zero understanding of the link between Islam uh, and militant Islamic activity. They try and have this worldview that the two things are completely and utterly distinct. Uh, no one is doing any assessment on why the enemy is actually fighting. Well, that's a big worry, isn't it? I mean, that's why we're losing the wars. We don't understand. We can say where the guns are, how they're getting there, what they're firing, where they're going, all that stuff. We can't tell you why the enemy is in a house or in a, a pit with a weapon pointed at us. We don't know why they're doing it. Yeah, and, and you've provided on your website a lot more information that our viewers can go to to understand those debates. Well, I want to thank you for being here this evening on the personal front and, and the broader issues that you bring to the table. Ben Fordham, thanks for coming thank you, along. Mate. Your second time Appreciate it. on Mark Looking Latham's forward outside. to whamming that. Uh, cream pie into your face <laughs> as soon as someone donates $500. Yeah, good on you for that. And I've got a tip for you too. You don't have to say www. No? No, I learnt this a few years ago. I'm a few years ahead of you. You never have to say that. Okay. No one actually punches no. in www. They don't? Okay. You just say Mark Latham's outside. I'm showing my age. Later. Thanks, Ben. You're going to, you're going to, you're, you're, you're going to organise a pie in my face <laughs> and you're outing me as a dinosaur. <laughs> this could be your last appearance here. No, not really. You've been fantastic. Thank you, mate. Thank you. And for our viewers, we'll go out with a couple of our street talk videos which are very popular looking at multiculturalism and unfortunately the lack of English language skills in Fairfield and Chris Bowen's electorate in Western Sydney and also Cabramatta, better on the English front but we do have some issues there, not enough ethnic mixing and integration in the community. Let's see what the street talk shows about Australian multiculturalism and its challenges. Thanks for watching Mark Latham's Outsiders. We'll see you next Wednesday at 8pm. Thanks for watching. Fairfield is said to be the multicultural super hub of Australia. Over 170 nationalities have settled in Fairfield. Here's an amazing statistic. Two thirds of the population here were born overseas. 70% speak a language other than English at home. Now what I want to find out about Fairfield is have we got genuine multicultural integration and mixing of people. Fairfield years ago used to be very much Italian but as you can see today it's become very much Arabic. A big Iraqi and Assyrian population. Some people now describe Fairfield as Little Iraq or Little Assyria. But are they mixing with the other multicultural communities in the Fairfield local government area? I'm right here in the town centre. I want to find out what people say about Cabramatta, the big Asian population just five minute drive from here. Have we got genuine multiculturalism in Australia or ethnic enclaves where the Fairfield people, the Arabic community, just stick to themselves and the Cabramatta community, the Asians just stick to themselves? Have we got genuine multiculturalism where people get to know each other, build trust and cohesiveness? That's what we'll be doing on the streets here today for Mark Latham's Outsiders. Speak to Mark Latham's Outsiders. Uh, what do you think of Cabramatta? I only speak, speak English. N nothing speak, at all? No, no, no. no English at all? No, okay, no, thank you. Wife. I do not like English. You don't speak yeah, no. English at all, really? Think uh, of no, Cabramatta? No English, no. No? No, no English, English at all? Think of Cabramatta. Syria, Syria. Syria, okay. Yeah. What do you think of Syria? Um, Lebanon. Lebanon. What do you think of Lebanon? No. Oh, okay, no, we can check it. Thank you. Well, the news from the streets of Fairfield is pretty disappointing. 90% of the people said they couldn't talk to me because they haven't got English. Now, Chris Bowen here is the Member of Parliament. He knows the story. He's been an Immigration Minister in the Rudd and Gillard governments, and it's quite disgraceful that 90% of the people are saying they've got no English. How can we have a proper, cohesive, cooperative, multicultural community if people don't even speak the basic language of the nation? We're going to have a lot better success in this country if people had basic English language skills. It's a disgrace that Chris Bowen and others have allowed this to happen. The government's got to step in here and uh, do everything it can to encourage and teach English. We can't have multiculturalism without people being able to talk to each other and build trust and cooperation. No English? No English? No? 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 No?
What do you think of Cabramatta? What do I think of Cabramatta? He's have to clean it up. Yeah? Big time. What's gone wrong down there? Well, the same thing as usual. Ice, drugs, the epidemic's going through the roof. Uh, it's good, not bad. Not bad? Not bad, yeah. Uh, we don't go there often. Right. But uh, Kaparamada is a good place, but uh, Turkey, they are great at me because Kaparamada is better. All blocks, mate. Full of blocks. What do you think of the Asian communities in Kaparamada? Well, you got good and bad in every community. You just you just got to turn around and start helping people in the community where there's no help for them to reach out and to get themselves better. And if they do reach out to get themselves better, they get put down to something of the worst. Yeah. Yeah, no. I'm, uh, I'm in fair uh -huh. Okay, as long as they keep it themselves, we don't have any issues. Uh, I don't want to know. You don't want to know those people? No. No, I don't know. I don't know. And do you visit Cabramatta very often? No, I don't because of the scene. Yeah. And what sometimes, do you, sometimes. And what, what do you find down there? Yeah, be, before, uh, I think, uh, two weeks. Right. I, I uh, went there. And what, what do you find down there? Uh, which uh, phone? My, my phone? Yeah, what, what's, uh, what's Cabramatta like? What do you do when you go there? There is uh, people there. It's not, not bad. It's good. Uh -huh. And all the streets there, it's cleaning. So you don't really go there at all? You just stick to Fairfield? I do. Yeah. Okay. People <laughs> tend to stick to where the communities are. Just well, to clean houses. Okay. So not, not very often. I haven't been there for the last 20 years. Last 20 years? Yeah. How because long have you lived in Fairfield? Uh, I've got shop 32 years here. 32 years? Yeah. And Cabramatta is only five minute drive yeah. away and you haven't been there in 20 no. years? No. So you, do you go down to Cabramatta no. or are you scared? No, no I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah. And have you got any Asian friends or people you know in, I've got a in Cabramatta? Yeah? Yes. And what do they ever say about the, set, the situation down there? They're not happy about it either. You know, they blame their own people. It can't just be their own people. It's a broad range of people that are doing it. So what can we do? No, no, I haven't. No. Only here. Only here. Everybody has their own area. That's, that's how you think Fairfield yeah. and Cabramatta operate. Yeah. Everyone has their own area and should stick yeah. to their own people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 4,000 uh, refugees in Fairfield settled each year. Essentially, they're going to become an ethnic enclave. Uh, the evidence from the past, the community here, is that people don't get down to a place like Cabramatta, which is just a five minute drive away, talk to the Asian community, get to know people, make friends across uh, racial and ethnic and cultural boundaries. It's not happening. This is the problem with Australian multiculturalism. The theory is not being matched by the practice. When the mainstream media and the left-wing elites talk about multiculturalism, They'd have you believe it's a case of the Asians live next door to the Iraqis, live next door to the Syrians, live next door to the English, the Yugoslavs, the Greeks, the Asians, the Iraqis, the Syrians. Everyone mixes together in the one street. That's not the case. We've seen at the Fairfield Town Centre, they might as well just be living still in the Middle East for all the mixing and integration they do in the broader community. Now, I've come just a five-minute drive, two train stops away to Cabramatta, the Asian centre of the Fairfield local government area. So I want to have a look here to see what the Asians say about Fairfield just up the road, the town centre not far away. Let's see if they've got any more positive attitudes about integration instead of going down the path of ethnic enclaves. That'll be part two of Mark Latham's Outsiders on the Streets, having a look at multiculturalism. Join us then. We hear a lot in the media about Australian multiculturalism. The truth is, you don't know what's going on the successes, the problems, the challenges, unless you get out here on the streets. So I've been to Fairfield, and essentially they're the Middle Eastern communities. They could still be in the Middle East. They're not reaching out and mixing with other cultures. They're not going beyond the boundaries of the Fairfield town centre. It's become an ethnic enclave. Now, just five minutes away from Fairfield town centre, we've got Cabramatta, a great thriving Asian community, a business centre, plenty of shoppers, plenty of activity. All going great. I'm going to talk to the local community here to see what they think 
about other parts of the Fairfield local government area. Hi there, can I just ask you what you think of Fairfield Town Centre? Do you ever go up to Fairfield shops just uh, to the north of here? No, I haven't yet. I haven't been there actually. Uh, I've been there a long time. A long time yeah. ago? Yeah. So you don't go there very often to see the Iraqi or Assyrian community? Uh, Sometimes. Uh, no, I don't. I usually no. just come here. And when was the last time you went to Fairfield Town Centre? I think last week. Last week? Okay, that's pretty uh, Last two weeks. Last two yeah. weeks? No, I never. Only You've never been up there? It's only yeah. five minutes up the road. You've never know, been there? But, but it's here more busy than there. Yeah. Oh, no. No? Yeah, just around here. Just around here? Have you got any Iraqi or Assyrian friends or no people in that no, community? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh no, no. I haven't gone. No? Yeah. You mainly stick here to Cabra Matter? No, I don't. No? No. Up no. there from those communities? No, no yeah. you don't know any of them? Town no. centre? No, no, none at all? No, no. I think they're in there. Just stick to this yeah. area? No, just no? Vietnamese friends. What do you think of the Iraqi and Assyrian communities at Fairfield? I'm not quite sure. I'm not in that area. I don't want to say. No, I don't really neutral. have any. I'm just neutral. I don't right, really okay. have anything against them. I have no idea. So. Well, in terms of uh, Asian integration into the multicultural community, you'd have to say a little bit better than Fairfield Town Centre, but not a lot. Most people just stick to themselves. Uh, there's no great desire to go meet or know the Assyrian or Iraqi population in Fairfield Town Centre. Uh, it's another example of where we run the risk of communities becoming ethnic enclaves. We need greater integration, mixing, sharing of cultures in Australia. The elites need to get out of Balmain, Mossman and Brunswick and Carlton and talk to these communities and find out what's really going on. A bit disappointing in terms of the quality and mixing of Australian multiculturalism.